and then talk really about the specifics of our production system. Yeah, no, that's, that's not it. <laughs> so I grew up working at Kingdom Greenhouses. I um, started at age 12, working there through college. So that was the beginning of my farming experience that was all conventional, but everything from you know, transplanting to retail and that business. Um, I grew up in Maine and ended up in the Midwest, and so I uh, grew up a city kid, actually, and now uh, went on to manage a couple farms, um, just small-scale vegetable production, apprenticed on caretaker farm. You may have heard of that in Massachusetts. I believe it's the second oldest organic farm, about 150, 200 members PSA. Went on to Iowa to start a small uh, farm to support Julie um, to see if we were right for each other, um, wild farming. And um, then Bert and I together went on to Victory Acres in Upland, Indiana, down, down by Muncie, and took a small farm from about 20 CSA members to about 125, 150. And we had two houses and chickens, so we've kind of done it all uh, in a lot of different ways. And now we're at our current location, living a small farm dream, um, and garlic is hopefully a key part of that. So another part of our farm is a winter produce program. Um, we just started that this past season. We built a hoop house last summer. We did um, just a seven-week CSA through the hoop house. Pick up at the farm, get into the delivery, find his office about a half far away. And that was really successful. We ended up with a waiting list by the end of the season. And also requests for more vegetables all the time. People saying, you know, my kids only eat your lettuce, just say it. So that's great. And we're planning on doing another trial. Um, we just started planting and we're hoping to have some in April, depending on our weather advisors. Uh, so, in terms of our specific garlic cart production, um, we were looking for a cart um, with organic hard neck garlic. We have to plant by hand because if you've ever done hard neck garlic, it has to be oriented a certain way, otherwise the neck gets bent and then people don't want to buy that. So um, there's yet to be a machine that can do that efficiently. Um, and so we were looking to scale up production that could do that for us um, and also ease some of the labor fatigue that goes into planting, mulching, those sorts of things. Um, also, in terms of looking towards sustainability, trying to find a, a system that we didn't have to till as much. We as vegetable farmers are, are guilty of probably over-tilling. And so we're trying to move away from that, especially in our really sandy soils, low organic matter. Uh, we, we need to really um, work on that. So that was kind of one of our goals. We were kind of hoping the car would help us mulch the straw and aid in harvesting as well. Um, one of the products we have so far is a review of carts available. So this is a 34 page document that's available on the SARE website that kind of um, part of our grant was working with Purdue University. So their ag engineering department had a couple students that came up to the farm, kind of figured out what we needed and it was their job to see what was out there 
and see if um, if they could come up with a better system, um, something that wasn't commercially available. So I'm not, I can weld, I'm not a great welder. So this was a great opportunity to partner and maybe come up with something better. So that document is available. So if you're thinking about ways to increase your um, comfort level, whether you have strawberries or any sort of crop, uh, it's a really useful document. So this is going to be an idea of how the production system actually looks like as we think about what kind of car, kind of machine would you like to help us on our farm. So you can see it, um, this is a picture from the end of the field, um, that's in October, but we're going to start looking at mid-July. So we scan a vertical pasture and we spread compost on the fields. And then, first part of August, that's when we do the cover crop. So we brought a broadcast for the cover crop, you can see we do oats, spring peas, radish, and we went to this bag. So that's the beginning of August. Then a month later in October, then comes over the tractor, we must cut the cover crop strips, um, create planting beds, and then we strip those beds to the final planting, and we add the amendments at that point. And then October 20 to 30, this is where we plant the garlic, and this is specifically what we're looking at the cart for. This is where we are doing everything by hand. Placing each hole in the ground. After you've done that, you know, you're covering them all back up and mulching it. And you can see it, you know, just from the position there that it gets to be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, then we have the nine months where the garlic sits in the ground and we plant early to mid July. We also start to do a big irrigation for the water of the garlic. Um, and then July we harvest and cure. So that's the basic production system that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. We'll take questions at the end just because we do have a short amount of time. So, yeah, we do hold time. Time. so here's some more pictures of us planting. Um, so we have these little uh, buckets around the lace to you know carry the ground to where we need to go. And then um, here's another picture just Again, trying to adjust your back so that you, you have a little piece amount of tension at the end of the day. So that's how we currently do our system. Work the ground part. A lot of hands and knees work, which you know, over a quarter acre that doesn't sound like a lot, but try doing that for four days straight, um, it really kind of adds up in terms of um, wear and tear on the body. So part of the grant was to kind of look at, okay, where do we really spend a lot of our time? Um, and where can we maximize the use of equipment? We're going to spend money on it. How are we going to use that efficiently? So uh, one of the things we did is looked at our system and timed it out. Okay, where are we spending our time? And if you add it all up, planting, harvesting, and mulching is where we are spending 60% of our time. And so, um, and then we also kind of looked at, okay, what's the most physically hard? Um, Actually, harvesting and hanging it, we spend a lot of time there, but that's actually somewhat not leisurely, but it's it's more upright work and, and it can kind of be done in different stages. So we kind of looked at planting as kind of the big one that we were trying to trying to address. So how do we eliminate back bending awkward positions? Um, how do we eliminate unnecessary tillage? So this cart's going to be have to have to be able to drive through this pretty um, heavy cover crop, and we'll show you some pictures here. And then, of course, related to that, in our sandy soils, you know, we have about 18 inches of topsoil, and it's all yellow sand. So, conserving that moisture is really important to us. Um, and then, what's a scale appropriate machine uh, for us? I'm just going to walk through real quick kind of what the student at Purdue found available options. Uh, here's a card he found, um, and looking further details, this card didn't end up working that well. The hand crank broke and couldn't really move it along but maybe it has some merits. Uh, this is something that currently exists in the US, about $3,500, um, but we didn't know, you know, we're not doing strawberries, we're doing garlic. Could it drive through that type of heavy biomass? Um, we weren't sure. Uh, this is another uh, cart that's quite a bit more expensive. Um, you'd have to import it into the US to find it, as far as we could tell. And then here's kind of the cream of the crop, the most ideal cart. Um, Kind of like a small tank on wheels, but again, it's, it's pretty expensive. 
So if you had a lot of acres, it might might work. Um, so here's some of the unique features. Yeah, the, these are unique features of how we do our garlic. So we plant, we have a tall living cover crop that's really important to our farm to build the soil, add those nutrients, create the aeration. We do garlic, not strawberries, and we saw some other parts. You have to have the right height for the crop that you're doing. Uh, we need something that's small, medium scale, appropriate. We, when we have a little new quarter acre, we like to you know, grow that, but it's not a full time thing at this point. And then also also something that can multitask planting, weeding, harvesting, mulching. Um, and then finally, we want something that can be built on farm. We have a welding shop like just across the street from us. Uh, you know, if you import something and there's mechanical problems, those can already be fixed right in your community. So that was something important to us as well. And then not motorized was preferred, but you'll see what happens with that. Yeah, and, and as with most grant projects, you go into these ideal thinking, ideal goals, um, and how it end, ends up is often very different. And that, that's okay. I think that's part of why um, Sayer does these types of funding projects. You don't have to necessarily accomplish all your goals. Uh, here's a picture of the tall cover crop. Um, these are our two boys here. And some years that cover crop can be four feet, depending on you know how the fall goes. Um, and and it's, it really provides probably 80% of our fertility for our garlic. So this is really important that we keep this. Here's uh, what it looks like. I've mowed the strip where our bed is going to be. We do two rows of garlic per bed. Our soils are that poor. We can't do it that any more intensively. Um, and then we um, rototill, strip rototill. And so you can see this thick mat right here um, of cover crop that is going to have to be able to be driven over by some sort of machine if we're going to plant. So here it is a close up with our drip tape. This is after planting. Um, and here's Julie doing some planting. And you can see that we have really a lot of uh, cover crop per garlic area plant. And we do that again for our soil. And we're actually moving towards a system where we don't rototill at all, but we just deep rip a, a row um, or a shank on our tractor um, so that we don't have to till at all. And so that's kind of, we were trying to think through how we plant into that. So here's uh, just our farm all 100 with the shank um, ripped through. Um, you can kind of see that there. We do have some video on our uh, YouTube channel that shows it specifically. We won't take time to play that today, but it is there. So this is what uh, the road looks like around mid-April. Uh, May-June, that's when we start getting the dark skate, uh, which we harvest and we sell or give to friends. Depending on where we're at. And then um, in July, we're looking for about a third of the plant ground down. And then we know it's time to harvest. Yeah. Uh, so the garlic cart, here's the actual cart um, constructed. Um, it's got a canopy here where a cart can be put. Um, and then it's a lay down design. Um, and we have, you know, a place where we can. Um, here's actually a better picture of some, some of the Purdue students actually driving it around. Um, and we went through about four engineering students and two professors. So turnover was really high, um, not because the car part was that difficult, but that's just the nature of working with um, you know university students. So that's something we learned. Uh, I was hoping to be up to about three quarter acre garlic production by this time, uh, but Carl oh, never. The cart never really got done, um, which actually turned out to be the best thing because um, maybe family structure time wise, we weren't really ready to go back to it. So, yeah, you're, we had to get an extension, which you know, Sarah was gracious to understand. Um, and at this point, uh, you know, the cart, they're having some trouble with the design. Um, in terms of how the wheels actually swivel when it's going down the road. So we're almost there. But now it's got a new student, new group of students working on it. So it is what it is. Uh, some lessons learned, keep it simple. I think we tried to put too many things into one cart. Um, maybe a couple versions down the road we could have done that. But I think uh, we 
you to acknowledge that up front. And the voter ended up being, you know, that was having a problem as well. Yeah. One of the problems with that. So uh, the students really wanted to motorize. Like, well, you think you can do it? Uh, yeah, I know, yeah. engineers. Uh, we found that the review of the current options was really valuable. That was um, part of the, the grant, that's something available to you too. Like Dan said, that the future report, you can look at that. So that was a great part of this. We have enough time. I mean, if, if you think a project's going to take two years, we have two and a half or three. Um, you know, it's, it's not an ideal world. Uh, try to, don't try to do too much. We kind of said that. Um, and it's about the process. We've really kind of refined our garlic growing process and really thinking about mechanizing why we want to do that. That has been valuable to us. And then just the concept of working with students is great, um, but there are some limits to that. So it goes both ways. All right. Uh, any questions? We got a couple minutes for questions. So and anything else? Yeah. A few questions. One about estimated cost and prepared by the school. Yeah, so we have a website where we sell um, hard neck seed garlic, um, and then we also do eating garlic. Um, and so we do eating garlic for about 50 cents a bulb, and then our uh, seed goes for about anywhere from 10 to $12 a pound. Um, since we're not certified organic, we can't charge quite that higher price, but that's certainly where, yeah, we're we certified natural ground. Uh, and our eating garlic price we went out, we actually have customers telling us you're not charging enough. Multiple people, so yeah. it costs us about 30 cents a linear row foot to produce the garlic. So we were, we thought, oh, 50 cents a ball, that's a pretty good cost to increase by the cost. We, we should do it more. Can we ask you yeah. other questions? Well, I was more about the price of where you guys are producing the garlic so far. Oh, I yeah, well, fortunately, one of the great things with working with Purdue is that they had the students each have a budget so that they can motor um, some of the materials they didn't have to pay for. So we did like a 50 50 pot share on that. So that worked, I mean, that, that worked out great. So we were about three grand into the project. Yeah. Okay, but let's the, the, the say that somebody wants to make that pot. You got the grant, but if somebody else wants to make the product that you designed, what they designed, what would the cost be for that without the grant? Right, and that's where the students have a, a, their final report. They'll have their materials with us. Yeah. Still in process. Yeah. yeah, excellent question. Yes. What, what do you use as a non-mechanized method for that price? Well, depending where the students end up with this, I'm thinking we might just take the motor off and pull it with our phone. Off. That might be the simplest. No. They, they thought about that, but I think the students weren't, didn't know enough or weren't, didn't have the staff to do that. I don't. Uh, but yeah, I think that's, that that's a, would be a viable option. How about just the electric motor? No electric golf cars. No electric golf cars taking the frame off. And... Yep, those, those are good points. Yeah. Yeah, and in that 34 page document, there's kind of a, an assessment of, of do we use electric wire or not? So. Is the one that you were showing before, I've seen that one for those specific ones. Okay. They were like, the one yeah. you said that the $3,000 through the strawberries, right? right. Yeah. So they were like, yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious what you're talking about, that one, and if you had something less high cover top? Um, I want my cover top to winter kill because we're not going to. We want it to grow as long as possible, and then we mulch. Sometimes we mulch in the fall, sometimes we mulch in the spring. And so I don't, I can't come in there with an herbicide to burn it down. Um, and I've planted, so I can't till. It's oats, radish, and uh, Canadian field peas. Can you give your blankets to those other questions? Yeah, that we, you know, we burn through that really quick. Um, Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Look at different rubber Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at different rubber 
Yeah, so we, the re, part of the reason we do two rows um, to a bed, and then our beds are 36 inches on center, is because of our soil fertility, our soils are so poor, you know, basically sands, um, and the way our cultivating tractor is set up, that was kind of the easiest. The cart was then designed for that, um, yeah, four feet wide. So that you could straddle one bed at a time. And you consider that a cover crop where you could use a row of preference in the springtime? The question is, have, have we considered using a, a roller crimper as a cover crop? Um, yes. The problem is roller crimping, um, like particularly winter peas, um, it needs to be flowering um, to actually kill it at crimping. Um, and likewise, the oats would have to be at um, drain fill. So yeah, some, something we could consider um, the timing didn't work for you. Yeah, it, it might if it winter killed, but again, ripping that narrow shank through, we may not even need the crimper, which is what we're using. So we're actually trying to not even touch the cover crop. Yeah. Are you doing uh, just one type of garlic? Good question. Uh, are we growing more than one type of garlic? Yes. We have about seven varieties right now. You know, we sell four. We sell yeah. Ukrainian music, um, German party, and caretaker. And then we have three or four others that we're working on building stock for. Are they all generally ones that uh, mature in the early July period, or are they going to go into the early? Yeah, our, some of our, um, we do like a porcelain, the comb, and uh, I, uh, Asiatic. Those are kind of three categories. And our Asiatics tend to Yes, uh, a wheat straw. Um, we have quite a bit of pasture that a guy cuts for us, and so we exchange hay for straw for the pasture. Do you find that it's hard to weed it all the minute, or you need to weed it when you need to weed it? Well, we mulch it thick enough so we don't have to weed it. That's, that's our goal. Um, but yeah, if we do need to weed, we are in there by hand. Yeah, I, I've um, done a little bit of experiment. We do apply a little bit of nitrogen, um, blood meal, because of our sandy soil. So I'm, I'm starting to try to cut that back a little bit more. Um, and, you know, we're looking at a soil test. We've only been in this spot for four years, so we haven't seen you know, the jump in organic matter yet. But yeah, it's something we're hoping. The cart once it's developed. So, the question that I have is the question of the cart. What do you think about increasing the amount of weight that you have access to? What benefits will the cart give you in terms of increased acreage? Okay, so the question is what benefit will a cart give us in terms of increased acreage? Um, so, right now, we don't hire anyone, just her and I. Um, and so, the, the cart will enable us. In my thinking, and looking at the numbers, to double production and still do that. And also, um, you know, a few years ago, Dan had to teach to give back problems to the point he can work. And, you know, those are fixed now, but we don't want that to happen again. So that's a longer time. It's just physical well being, exactly. Yeah. And our, and our goal is hopefully someday to farm the full time. It's just we're taking it slow, and we're going we're gonna to do things that are best for our family. Well, um, the question was, is the cart used for harvest? Um, I don't think it will be. But right now when we harvest, we're able to pull the plants um, because our soil is so light, it's one advantage of a thing. Um, and we pick it right into a wagon pulled by a truck. So it's, that's much more efficient. Uh, what's your current deal on that? Uh, <clears throat> I, I, the 
question was, what is your current yield on a quarter acre? Um, so we do, uh, and I haven't looked at these numbers in so long, uh, the garlic maybe plant it and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but we, we plant the bald every six inches. So our rows are about 250 feet long. And so we have, let's just say we had 10 rows. So that's 10 times 250. <laughs> 2,500 times 2 is 5,000 bulbs. And about probably 40 to 50% of that is actual marketable seed garlic in terms of size and grade. And then the rest um, are in and grade. That's typically what we plant. That varies by variety, um, but that's a general. Any other questions? I haven't seen any. Yes, we do foliar feed, um, calcium particularly, because in sandy soil, calcium one of the first things to leach out. Um, and so we I do a little fish fertilizer and calcium mix. But I spray it every about 14 days during the during the month of kind of end of April through May. And we found that that makes a significant difference. Do you have business cards if anyone wants one for our contact information? Um, we have a website and a Facebook page, and you know, glad to take questions and always willing to learn and grow from other people trying to grow garlic. Um, yeah. Yeah, we actually sell out our garlic seeds for sale. Yeah, and we have a lot of customers now in June, and then they pre orders and it goes really fast. So that's why we're looking up our numbers. We'd like to move into restaurants and grocery stores, but like we said, it's a slow growth, it just takes a while. So, yeah, you use it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.